Okay, so um, uh, I uh, am going to have a bit of a chat today about what we've been doing is, uh, with the position controller that's uh, gonna that's been causing a bunch of people some grief as we try to get it all in and test it. Um, I uh, haven't uh, spent a hell of a lot of time preparing this talk, so uh, I've rather been rather well busy the last few weeks, and so I thought I'd take my standard approach that I take to coding, and that's uh, copy and paste a bunch of Randy's work and then add some spelling mistakes and start from there. Um, so these next few slides I've, uh, I've stolen from Randy. Now a lot of people here, I'm not sure, there's a lot of people here with that will understand PIP controllers and have fought through tuning and debugged what Randy and I have done here and there and uh, have a good understanding of this. And a lot of people that are probably, and a few people probably never actually really looked at what's happened there or have just loaded up the defaults and got, it, got their aircraft flying and then hit auto tune and sort of hope for the best. Um, so I'll start out with a little bit of a background of uh, what basic PID loops are and what we're trying to achieve with them. And so I'll try and build up, build up a, a, a story um, and a progression of our um, development over the years that's taken us to where we are now. Basic PID, PID loop, um, uh, proportional integral differential controller. So we, we effectively what we do with a PID loop is we take an error term here, which is our target, subtract what we're measuring. So we want to be here, we are here, we have this much error. Um, and we take that error and we say, well, if, we're, if we've got an error this much, we're here, we want to move in that direction, we need to push ourselves in this direction. And we're going to um, define how hard we push by taking that error and in the first instance, multiplying it by a scalar number. So if that scalar number is one, we've got one meter of error, we're going to push with say one newton of force against um, a cell, uh, against this object to move it in, in uh, to bring it close to that, uh, that, that set point, our desired spot. Um, so obviously as your error comes to zero, you stop pushing it. Now that's fine if you're pushing a chair along a, a carpet, nice and draggy when you stop pushing it stops moving and you stop on the spot. Very different if you're pushing uh, a skater along the ice. Um, you've actually been pushing for a meter and they don't stop, they keep on going and they overshoot and all of a sudden you're pushing them back and you end up swinging back and forth trying to get the spot because you're only ever pushing them to the spot, there's nothing stopping them from moving on the other side. Um, now the D-term, the D-term deals with that by saying, okay, if my error is going getting smaller, I'm actually going to push back, I'm going to break, I'm going to dampen that response so it's like a shock absorber on the car so as we're pushing towards that spot we're going oh we're getting closer so I'm going to start breaking and slowing down so that skater on the ice now as it gets closer to the spot comes to a, a full stop hopefully. Now the other uh, item is what happens if that skater is standing in a strong wind? Um, if you've got one metre of air, you've got this much force, and you've got a strong wind that actually happens to equal that force, you never actually close that gap. And so you've got this gap, you know, you've got one metre of air, so you're pushing this hard, um, and the wind is forcing back against you. So the, how do you actually then close that gap? And that's what the I term does. The I term builds up over time. So if you've got an error for one second, a one meter error for one second, that's a one unit. So that if P is one and I is one, you've had that error for one second, you've just doubled the amount of force that you're pushing. And what happens is that will build up until it overcomes the force of that wind on you, and that will then allow you to close that error. So, You've got your P term, which is just proportional to the error. You've got the D term, which is proportional to how fast that error is changing. And you've got the I term, that is proportional to how long that error has been um, 
present. So the basic PID loop is acting in that way, and I'm not going to go into detail of all that means, but uh, when we talk about a PID loop, we're talking about those basic principles. But in the end, we have a simple target we want to get to, we have a measurement that we've taken, and we want to make a target, a measurement equal to our target, and we act on that in a PID loop. Really simple concept, we do it all the time whenever we, whenever we push the fridge around or our kids. Um, so, there's a few things that we, that, that allow us to, to do this PID loop better. Um, so, uh, a, a big part of that is how long it takes us to make a measurement and act on it. So, if I'm pushing that skater and I've got to wait for two seconds before I decide I'm going to stop pushing, that skater can be a long way past the point before I react. Um, and we, and so in a um, copter, that's to do with our PID loops, and this is where uh, certain speed improvements that's going to be discussed later is making me very happy because it allows me to up my loop rates and 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 react and shorten um, the lag, the delay in my PID loops. That allows me to tighten things up because I'm able to react a little bit faster. It means I can react a little bit stronger without overdoing it. So, um, uh, we, in practical sense, that means um, ensuring we have a minimum amount of filtering uh, for our needs, for our needs, um, faster sampling of sensors, which is, means that, that we're waiting less for the next measurement, um, and doing less crap between making the measurements and acting on them. So once we've got this simple PID loop, we've got a um, uh, we've got a skater, and instead, let's say instead of, with a skater, instead of actually trying to control where the skater is, we're trying to control how fast the skater is actually moving uh, on the ice. So when we want it to go faster, we push harder. When we want it to slow down, we push back. Um, we can then so if, if we put a PID loop around the speed or the velocity, um, we then can put consecutive PID loops to then control position. So we have a PID loop that controls position and makes the velocity request to the, to the velocity PID loop. And in that way, we, we um, nest PID loops in others. So we have a feedback in this rate loop, and this rate loop only cares about rate. We then have another feedback that brings in the position and we then make a velocity request to the velocity loop. And um, there's a couple of, uh, uh, when we go up in loops, you need to go, the, the loops need to act slower. So you control velocity quickly and you control position, you know, an order of magnitude slower, <coughs> or at least half as fast. You don't try and up, you don't try and make changes in position faster than you try and make changes in velocity. It doesn't make sense. Um, so there, there are two major things I want to, to draw your attention to. One is the P, uh, which is the same as this one. We haven't put the I and B in. The other is the feed forward. We'll talk a lot about that later. The feed forward allows us to tell the velocity controller, I want one meter per second, but also, I want to correct for this error separately. And that's going to be a really important concept when we look at the attitude controllers later on. I'm just going to get a little time there. What time did I start? What time do you want me to stop talking? Oh, go for whatever time is convenient for you, half an hour ish, but you know. Um, yeah, so we've got about, we've got about 20 minutes to do Yeah, but if yep. you want to go over... No, I just, I just wanted to get an idea of where I was going. We're very flexible. Um, so, um, yeah, so what, when, when we actually... Uh, um, these, these little simple concepts, when we, we, when we deal with all of the... Uh, so it, it's easy 
to build a, a, a pin loop when you've got um, no constraints, everything's linear. Um, when, when we start dealing with uh, real aircraft, or real devices that can only do so much, you start having to deal with the limits. You've only got an actuator that goes from plus 100% to minus 100%. So what do you do when your error is such that you're asking for 150%? Um, and that's where uh, there are a number of little things that you, we implement, such as item, we prevent the item from building up. What is the point of asking to push harder because you've had an error for you know, a couple of seconds and the item's building up, if you can't push harder? All that means is you're going to be asking for 200%, so uh, that's 100%, you know, that's twice what you can actually push. So um, when, that, when you actually get it back in control, um, you need to unwind this I-term back down with, a, with an error going the other way um, uh, before everything starts working properly again. So uh, we, we do a bunch of things in the code where we detect saturation or limits and we feed that back through the layers of code to prevent I-term buildup which would then cause an overshoot, an unnecessary overshoot when we actually uh, move back into an area where we where we come off the limits. So this happens, for example, um, with uh, the attitude controller. If you've um, had a disturbance and the aircraft has gone upside down um, from about 30 degree error or something like that, these motors are probably at 100%, you know, and, and you've flipped. Um, when it comes back, if the items build up, you're going to get an overshoot that I, and then it'll come back to level because that item has to unwind again. So because as soon as it um, saturates, and that's probably saturated primarily from the P and the D term at that point because it's moving away from the desired attitude, um, as soon as it comes back where it unsaturates, the item hasn't been allowed to build up because it was frozen. So we have this, the, these um, little mechanisms in the code that only allow the item to reduce during saturation. So if the saturation happens to be reducing the item, hey, great, no problems. But if it's increasing it, we don't, inc we don't allow it to grow. Um, and so if you're looking through the code and the controllers, you'll have these limit flags that are being set. And those are progressively passed up through the controllers to um, address these saturation issues. So um, we have a, 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 a concept, um, that, and it's most obvious, and most you, you're probably seeing it when looking at the attitude controllers. We have a, a number of stages. What I've described here just sits in this PID controller architecture. Um, now, we have uh, a number of, uh, two, two things that actually uh, happen before we start trying to actually uh, control the, act the attitude. Um, and, and this last step here, the mechanical actuators, that's the ESC outputs or the outputs to, the, to your flaps and that sort of thing. So, this uh, um, input translation. So, um, what we did early on is we fed our requested angle directly into the PID controller. So the PID's happily sitting there, it's in a hover, everything's, uh, everything's uh, uh, lovely, all the, all the error terms are like nice and small, and all of a sudden um, you put in full stick. So it's sitting there happily and all of a sudden you're asking for this. Um, the, the, a sudden increase in error happens, the D term skyrockets all of a sudden, so uh, a an impulse, a step function going through a differentiator results in an infinite output. Um, that's reduced for filtering and that sort of stuff, but we won't get into that just yet. Um, and the P term, uh, yeah, yeah, so all of a sudden these motors go to a, go to, um, a sudden uh, full throttle as it tries to actually chase this sudden change. That results in lots of little nasty little behaviours and you know, little tweaks, you know, twitches and, uh, you know, ESCs, you know, jumping. Uh, and, for example, if your, your input rate is at a 50 hertz coming from your radio. So, 
that the uh, PID group loops are running at 400 hertz. So the, so the PID loop sees a little step response. Every uh, eight samples, it sees a step response, which is going, going through the D-term. It's like somebody just hitting the ESCs with a stick, you know, at 50 hertz, you know. Um, which, of course, if you've got these sudden changes in an ESC, it's a, it's a hit on your efficiency. Um, it doesn't sound nice, and a lot, a lot of this is sort of subconscious to a pilot. It, it just doesn't feel right. It, it takes away the confidence in the vehicle. So um, the input translation, what that does is it says, um, I, so, sorry, the input shape, what that does is addresses those issues. It takes this low rate, um, ugly, impossible uh, input, to, and it turns it into a, a sensible, kinematically correct velocity acceleration, or you know, position velocity acceleration jerk, which is the rate of change of acceleration, limited uh, output that feeds into the pit loops. Now, what that does is it provides a really nice, smooth, high rate command to the pit loops, which means our D-term isn't getting hit with a stick on a regular, like every 50 hertz, um, and it also allows us to define the way the aircraft feels to fly. So we can take a nuts racer and make it feel like a two meter camera ship by adjusting the input shaping, while at the same time maintaining the disturbance rejection of the 250 racer, that, that high speed reaction to an external disturbance. So, um, so that, that this input shaping um, it is a really important uh, concept when we talk about the attitude controllers and the position controllers uh, and the navig and loiter in particular. So um, the other the other thing there was a, we we had something called the twitch hump that we were doing for a long time. And what it, what it was, was when we change modes from one mode to another, you need to precondition the controllers. So we're going from acro, we've had a battery fail safe, and we switch to RTL, which is a fully autonomous mode. And we might be doing that at 120, 150 kilometers an hour. So all of a sudden, uh, attitude, uh, uh, navigation controls have just been hit with this massive startup condition, um, and we've got massive errors potentially because uh, we want to be going at you know, 10 meters per second to cruise back. We're actually doing 30 or 40 meters per second. So how do we ensure a clean transition of our pid loops without having all the saturation happening until it sort of pulls itself into control again. And we do that by preconditioning the PID loops when we start them up. So for example, a P controller, or the square controller, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, uh, we can do that by simply just changing the set point. So if we currently have a velocity of 10 meters per second, um, what we do is we set our position error, and we've got a P of one, we set our position error for 10 meters in front of the aircraft, and we've got a p-term of one, which is going to ask for that 10 meter per second velocity. And so what's happened is the, uh, it, the, it puts that controller in a state where it's sort of, it's just woken up, everything's in balance, and it's, it's as if it's been running the whole time, and it's in perfect control. And so everything tangentially joins together, and it, and it slows down as that position error closes, and it's just like, oh, I've woken up and I've actually got this large position error, but everything's, oh, the large position error, but you know, that's why I'm doing this speed. And you know, so I'm happy. The world is the way it should be. Um, for the PI controller, um, one of the things we can do, uh, we have the I term, so we can actually use a zero error. And this depends on the input, the way we're actually using the, the PID loop at the time. We could just do this and leave the I term zero, but we're also able to set the I term to request the velocity that we've currently got. And in that way, we can use the I term uh, wind down to, 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 let, to smoothly take that velocity request down. 
Um, and finally, we've got the PID controller where um, you've also got this differential term and where you have a rate of change of your input going on and you will uh, potentially have to deal with a, an additional offset to account for the current rate of change that you're, you've got through going through the system in order to make sure everything has this nice smooth transition without you know, seeing a twitch as you change that mode. Um, and it's amazing how once you get everything navigating properly and you know uh, uh, everything tightens up, next thing you start getting flooded with this, oh, I go through this waypoint and it just, you know, and it's like, oh, what? Right, and you start getting these reports, you get 100 reports, these twitches coming in, and you get the logs out, and you look through there, and there's like a, a, a two degree change in the attitude as it goes through this waypoint, and, and it's an audible clack on the, on the, and people don't like it, it it's unsettling. When it, the better you control it, the more fussy people get. So, uh, position control problems. So, as you can sort of see, you start, we've got a really simple concept of this PID controller and we beat a few loops in, and then you start dealing with the real world and limits and initializations and, 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 and end, end points. So with this position controller, um, we've actually no longer just got a single axis we're trying to deal with, we're dealing with three simultaneously. And we're lucky with a multi-rotor, two of those, um, the lateral movements, you know, left, right, forwards, back are, are the same. And so you can sort of treat those similarly. But the vertical axis is very different. Sometimes you've got an overpowered copter that can pull very high Gs and, you know, at very least, no matter how powerful the copter is going up, it's still limited to one G going down for a fixed pitch uh, copter. But left, to right, forwards, back, but your standard multi-rotor can be treated the same. Um, the other thing is, when we want an acceleration, um, while well, vertically, you know, the ESCs and the motors have quite a fast response time for navigation. You know, so you can sort of go, I want one G of acceleration vertically, and those motors are going to twack straight up, and you get one G effectively instantly on the time scales of your navigation position controls. But your lateral, you've got to wait for the vehicle to roll or pitch before you actually see that acceleration. And not only that, the actual, if, if I turn the aircraft on the side like this, but I've set my throttle to zero, I don't get any lateral acceleration. So the actual sideways acceleration is dependent on the amount of thrust. The amount of thrust is dependent on whether I'm trying to accelerate vertically or, uh, or not. If I'm, trying, if I'm not trying to accelerate vertically, I can assume it's 1G vertical, so it's a nice vector calculation. But I'll told is working all the time to maintain altitude, so you get a variation in that acceleration. So you get all these non-linear, uh, uh, you know, all these errors coming in. Um, so, um, when we get to each waypoint, we're talking about um, this initialization. As we go to each waypoint, we also go through the sudden transition. Now, when, when we go, if we've got a waypoint with a directly straight line, when you hit that, that waypoint, we can go through that, no problems, no acceleration, constant velocity all the way through. Now, as people, you know, we're used to moving around the world, so if I walk in a straight line and I want to change direction, it's like, that's all right, that's easy. We change direction, don't have to slow down, everything's cool. But what we don't realise is we haven't done this. As soon as you put two straight lines together, you cannot follow that path without coming to a complete stop on that position and accelerating off on a new direction um, and and follow that path because there is an infinite acceleration at this point in this direction you in this direct while you're traveling here you've got a zero velocity in this direction as soon as you go on this track you've got a velocity in that direction 
So you cannot go in that velocity, start that velocity instantaneously without being able to have an infinite acceleration. So, okay, well, to, in order to actually um, uh, gradually increase that acceleration, as soon as we gradually, we'll step off this line. So you, that's why you have to come to a complete stop unless you cut the corner. So you have to handle these corners. And again, if you sort of watch the progression and the feedback from the navigation, the better it happens, people start going, oh, I've got around this corner, I'm doing you know, 30 meters a second and I turn right and it really cuts the corner really badly. Or you know, I'm flying in a heli and I barrel into this, this corner and the heli, rears back like this and then and it's like okay we've got a, we've got a contradiction you either want to maintain velocity through this corner and have a nice arc in turn and you know your waypoints there and you end up missing it by a hundred meters but you maintain your velocity or you rear back and slow down and then creep through the that waypoint nice and close to your waypoint and which which do we do? The answer to that question is it depends heavily on what the user wants. So we have to deal with all, the, all those things. Um, one of the ways we do that, I mentioned this before, um, is we use the square root controller. Now what the square root controller does, the square root controller recognizes that if you just have that simple P error, um, as you approach following a velocity is proportional to your distance error, error um, you can plot the acceleration and you get a line like this red one. And it's fine and close, you know, your accelerations are nice and small. But that acceleration grows linearly with distance. So if you're trying to use a standard pid loop to approach a point, um, what happens is you very quickly get into a point where you need to be able to follow an acceleration that you can no longer achieve. So um, uh, a good uh, example of this is you can stop from 60 kilometers an hour, you know, from let's say 20 meters from the red lights. Quite calm, yeah, it might be a little bit of an aggressive braking. Now, if you go back 40 meters and increase that speed to 120 kilometers an hour, how are you going to feel about running into that, those traffic lights with traffic going this way? The answer to the question is you're going to be kicking <coughs> yourself. Um, and that's because you need uh, more distance to, uh, more than twice the distance to accelerate, decelerate from 120 kilometers an hour down to zero than from 60 kilometers an hour down to zero. Because it's twice and it's a, in square lot, you need four times the distance. So that's what the square root controller um, accounts for. And what it says is, we're going to operate a nice, linear, well-known, well-characterized PID loop for small errors, but when we're closing a large error, we're going to use a square root function, which is an acceleration-limited approach. And so that way, with a copter, as we approach, um, it can lean back at a known maximum amount. It'll follow that curve, and then it will get to the PID loop, um, the P tap, and come in like this to a nice controlled stop. As opposed to if it was a standard P term, it would rear back like this, not achieve it, blow past the thing, and then have to overshoot like this. And that's what one of the things we had early on with our navigation is everything would work fine until you went past a certain error. And then there would be these massive rings around the oval. I remember doing an RTL from a little bit further away and the aircraft coming back. And where it worked fine up until that point, all of a sudden it's doing 50 meters rings around the desired spot. How do you set the error limit? Is it a parameter per beat plot? So um, you've got two parameters that, set that, that will set this. What, like the error itself comes from your position versus where you want to be in the pit loops, right? Yeah, typically you want to take action based on how big the area is depending on what the speed is. So uh, what, what we do is we give you um, the, the tuning parameter, which is the P term, which, which defines this part, and then we have a maximum acceleration. 
um, that you define, and we use that maximum acceleration to calculate this curve. And so we um, take that from your maximum lean angle, for example, because we, from that we know what your maximum acceleration request is. And then we make a few sensible decisions um, about how you, the information you give us about how you want the aircraft, the limits of that aircraft, what those values are. So a lot of this stuff is transparent from the user. You get sort of go, oh, well, in, in navigation controller, I don't want it to go past 30 degrees. And so we'll then say, okay, well, 30 degrees is, a, is an acceleration of this. We'll give ourselves a little bit of headroom there and we'll put our maximum, we'll set the maximum acceleration of the square root controller to that value. So you don't care about the size of the vehicle because that's inherently linked to the acceleration capability? Uh, well, the size of the vehicle with navigation is independent because it's all based on the vertical thrust and we assume that um, in a normal state the aircraft is on average hovering, which means it's got a force equal to its mass vertically, which means that when it tilts over, a small aircraft and a large aircraft will accelerate by the same rate um, sideways for a given lean angle if it's holding altitude. So once you get to the navigation controllers, the, the um, size of the aircraft doesn't matter too much. What does matter is how fast it can roll and pitch over the jerk of that acceleration, the rate of change of that acceleration. For a small aircraft that can twitch very quickly left and right, that delay is really small. But for a larger aircraft that does this, um, you know, and we tend to have to get up to one meter plus size aircraft, um, then I've found I've had to half the, the, the position control of pit loops to compensate for that. Um, or if you set your um, your small aircraft to be very docile, like very docile, um, you know, near the minimums that we have on those um, input shaping parameters, then you'll start to potentially see navigation issues. I'm but gonna, it's at the extremes. So on the camera you have a for the wind, you see that rear end effect. Now, now there are a couple of things that can cause this, and this is where it gets complicated. It could be a tuning issue as you get propeller flapping, and you go from this mode to this mode, propeller flapping wants to turn you into a parachute, or it could be overshoot in your, in your navigation controls, commanding a large attitude. And so um, in order to diagnose that, you've got to go back and have a look at the loops, and you've got to be able to see the navigation controls and see what that's asking for, and, you, and the, the, the key is looking at the, the attitude controllers and looking at your attitude error. If you're getting precisely what you're asking for, then it's probably an over, uh, you know, your, your PID loops or your acceleration parameters are too high or something like that in your navigation controller. Um, if you are getting a large attitude error, you're, it's probably a, um, a, a tune a tuning issue, so it could be the input shaping on your attitude, or your acceleration parameters could be too high, and it's just being too aggressive given the aerodynamics that you're faced with for that for the maximum speeds and that sort of stuff. So precisely where you have that problem depends a lot on your settings and the dynamics of the vehicle. So um, flexible propellers have a have a much more power flapping torque on them and they tend to balloon up more in that situation and things like that. There's a couple of other interactions that can cause that with throttle priority overall and pitch and stuff like that too. But I won't I won't get too much I won't go down that rabbit warren too much, but suffice to say, feel free to talk to me about it. Um, so um, what have we done with this new loiter? Uh, the simple answer is nothing. Um, the complex answer is uh, we've cleaned up the PID loops a lot. We've removed some of, the, uh, of what was effectively a hard-coded D-term um, and we've simplified the structure. Now that doesn't sound like much work, does it? So I'd better, I'd better build myself up a little bit more than that. Um, the, the tricky thing with with, uh, uh, with with this is how we uh, we have opened up um, the PID loops to take in a separate acceleration, velocity, and position request at each PID loop. So 
if we have our desired position of our aircraft and we have um, our position of our aircraft, now in order for a standard pit loop to move this aircraft to the, let's do it to the left, the left will be easy, to move this aircraft to the left, we need to have a request to move that to the left. With a pit loop, the only way to get that request is by creating an error. So we move the desired position to the left, that creates an error, which creates a request for the aircraft to move to the left. Now, the problem with that approach is this. We have a desired position now that is different to our actual position, and that's the way we navigate at the moment. We, we have a rubber band that we, you might have heard us talking about, this rubber band that pulls the aircraft around, and that's what it allows us to go through that, um, that transition um, that infinite acceleration transition, because the aircraft isn't being asked to go through that inf infinite acceleration. This, this pretend point that's pulling it around on this rubber band goes through that transition. And this rubber band creates the shock absorption for the aircraft that turns that infinite acceleration into a, into a nice docile movement. The problem with that is that when you accept the acceleration parameters and the velocity parameters, as Randy, you know, Randy used to have a full head of hair before we see, we do with navigation. Um, I still have. Um, the, uh, you know, you start get all of a sudden getting these sudden rear ups and um, uh, th this is where you get these large, if you've got a low acceleration and a high velocity, it cuts the corner really badly because that, that rubber band is really long. Whereas if you've got a high acceleration or low velocity, that, it's, that rubber band's really short and you get these really aggressive little turns through, through the corner. Um, so it allows us to, if we're in this position, it allows us to say, okay, um, we've got our PID loop, so we're gonna feed the request in, we're gonna tell the request with our input shaping, I want my requested, my desired position, to accelerate to the left at 9.8 meters per second. I know what that angle is. Um, but I'm going to use a feed forward into the acceleration um, output that controls the attitude and say, I want my acceleration output to be 9.8 meters per second. So what happens is the aircraft goes to 45 degrees as soon as we command that. Let's pretend it's instantly. We don't have any jerk in it. And our aircraft and our desired location move together. So the PID loops are all dealing with zeros. The error stays zeros, the PID loops stay zero. If we get hit by a little bit of a gust, the PID loop brings it back to this spot. If we have jerk limiting and it takes a small fraction of time for this to rotate over, um, we have a small error there where it didn't quite get up to speed as fast and the PID loop will close that. And so using this feed forward, it allows us to be much more precise in how we command this navigation. And this is where the complexity comes in. That, in, we, that input shaping now has a lot more control over the aircraft. So, we now have a desired position but it's feeding an error down into the velocity controller that's also receiving a velocity request. That's looking at the error and what it's achieved and makes a correction to the acceleration uh, controller that's also re receiving an additional acceleration request. And so now, whereas before we would just move this position around, now we move a position, velocity, and acceleration around. And this is where the complexity comes in. All of a sudden, you're defining, um, in going from a single position, hey, go here, and you move that around, and it just chases this position on a rubber band, to you should be here doing this velocity with this acceleration. So this is where it gets complicated. Um, now, the uh, loiter controller is set up, sorry, the, it is set up as a, an acceleration input. And that's great. The problem is 
you can't just ask for a positive acceleration indefinitely because you get an infinite speed and we've got this annoying thing called aerodynamic drag. Um, so you've got a maximum velocity and that velocity is not all that high. So um, if you accelerate at a certain level, you will get, uh, let's say, 10 meters second maximum velocity. So what we do is we actually put in this input shaping, we have this fake drag calculation and we say, okay, we're going to pretend that we've got a, um, a drag coefficient that's acting on us. And at our maximum velocity, at this, this lean angle, we will have a drag of this much and our velocity will, will stop um, increasing. So when we actually predict what our velocity is over time, and, and um, we, we subtract the acceleration due to this predicted drag. And so our velocity will reach a maximum specific value. Now, if you, uh, uh, have, you know, we'll, we'll get onto the problem that in a second. So what did we change with Loiter? So we added the acceleration feed forward into, into that mix. Now, whereas before, in order for your whole right stick that position would move across to the right, and then the aircraft would bank. So you would command right movement with a stick, and then you'd get right movement with the aircraft. You'd get this delay, you know? That drops confidence. It, 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 you know, it, it did what it's supposed to do, but it, you know, yeah, the, the pilot feels a little bit disconnected. Without, I'm told, you know, straight away, as soon as that stick goes across, great, all of a sudden, click to loiter, delay. It's, it's a little bit, it's just a little unsettling. Um, and, and more and more what we deal with is this human interface. Make it, getting this human interface right, giving the pilot what they want to feel in a way that they want to feel. And there are a lot of personalities out there, so that can be a little bit difficult. So, what with this acceleration feed forward, we're not going, oh, we want to move the position off to the right, please chase me where we get this late. We're saying, we want to move this position off the right, and it's accelerating. It's a jerk limited acceleration on that input shaping. We want to move the position off the right, so we're expecting a um, velocity of this and an acceleration of this. So as soon as you move that stick across the right, we're actually getting an angle change request, just like in stabilizer roll toll. So now, instead of getting this, you're getting this, where that desired position directly follows where, where the aircraft stays almost on top of that desired position and responds directly with your stick input. That sounds really simple. The, where the emphasis on this comes in and what makes it difficult is you need to know what that aircraft can achieve given the parameters from the user. If those are wrong, you might go, all right, I want to move to the right, and the aircraft does this. <laughs> because it's predicted an incorrect acceleration based on your request. Or you're too fast and you get this again. And, it, and then it does this. So you let go of the sticks and it goes, and it keeps on moving longer than it should. And that, Randy, well, I've got this problem, I let go of the sticks and the copter keeps on going. Um, why can't you make it work like I want it to? <laughs> I know you work for free and you have infinite time. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> so what we so so effectively what we've got when we do this is that we've got a, uh, a an acceleration input that gives us a, a velocity request. <coughs> the other issue we have um, is we have a problem that if you ask for a high acceleration, I want I want to be, but I only want it to move at five meters a second. Well, one meter a second, but god damn it, when I put that stick over, I want it to lean over like it does in old hold, but I don't want to go too fast. So you end up, it goes, in order to do that, it's got to go shh, and lean back to like two or three degrees at two meters a second to, to not over speed. So all of a sudden, you no longer have a correct relationship between those two things and how to do it. And this is the next thing Randy spent and I spent 
a lot of time sort of talking about trying to work out how we can solve this problem. So we've got a, a, an acceleration versus velocity curve that looks like this, but we've got a maximum acceleration that is significantly higher. So um, we can't follow this curve because then at maximum stick input it's only going to go over like this and people are going, not going to be able to get that assertive control around hover. But at the same time, if you go with large accelerations, you go too fast at the max end. So what we do, what we're, what we're looking to do, is we're looking to remove the difference between these two. So if you're not, a, it, so very quickly, um, as you speed up, um, this section, this angle, this acceleration request is removed from the table. So you're compressing that envelope. So if you let go of the sticks, at this velocity, you're only going to be lent over like this. And if you let go of the sticks, it's only going to move that back that far. Even though when you were stationary, that would have resulted in a 30 degree lean angle. As soon as you speed up, it, it, it comes back down to the desired value. This is where a drag prediction would be really good, Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the spare time, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> when you have um, so, so, um, but at the same time, if you are cruising along with half stick at you know, one meter per second, um, if I jack that stick all over, I want the other you know, uh, 22 and a half degrees, God damn it. Um, I still want to feel that I've got control. And if I want to break, I don't want to be leaning back at two and a half degrees. I want a full 45 degrees back to break because I want to feel like I'm in control. So a lot of contradictions here. And so the way we're looking at doing that is removing this section here. So at half stick, you've still got the next 22 and a half degrees with the rest of that stick movement. But if you let go of the stick, it still just goes back to a level. And um, it allows us to separately define the relationship at full speed versus the requirements of the pilot at hover. Um, and it's, this, this is the trivia went. All of the controllers have been done. The, the loiter drag coefficients and you know that relationship's all working beautifully. All of this is in that little input shaping stage. Interpreting what the users want and can't express most of the time um, and turning that into something that makes sense mathematically that doesn't have um, uh, gaps and impossibilities and, and uh, lines that don't meet up at a nice tangent or with a nice curve and making sure all those transitions happen smoothly. So, um, this is a line. Um, if I'd had more time, I would have added labels to this line and made it more obvious what was going on. <laughs> um, so what does this do for the uh, attitude controller? Ooh, I'll have to end soon. Um, so, what does this mean for the attitude control, uh, for the navigation controller? Um, so, we want to completely rewrite the navigation controller. Uh, we want to get rid of that leash. We want to define precisely um, the position on that line at any given time, so we can precisely define what turn radius we want. So, we want to be able to fly like a plane which is sort of like a drunk bloke walking along the road back from the pub that I saw last night. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, or copter, which is a dead precise, you know, train, train on the rails type response. And so how do we get both of those things? Um, and the, the answer is by being able to precisely control the copter, we can make it look like it's a walking dungeon. <laughs> we can do that because a plane, what a plane does, it says, I'm going to go in that direction and I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to keep the throttle at this particular setting. And now the next waypoint's over there and I'm going to go there. I'm going to keep my speed. I'm not going to worry about really where that waypoint is. I've forgotten about that one already and I'm off over there and I've sort of got to move over here a bit to get back on track. We can do that by calculating the radius of this circle. 
Sorry about the weird. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, uh, we, we can do this by calculating the radius of that circle such that the acceleration limit matches our maximum velocity. And so when we get to a way, um, to a lake, we don't have to slow down because we know we've got this much acceleration, so we've got this much radius, so we've got to start turning this far before the waypoint and we'll be able to tangentially meet this track. So we'll be able to use the L1 controller type maths to do intersecting curves, but instead of in plane where you sort of um, use it to deal with the error and sort of get it back on there, the copter will follow that path really precisely, but we'll be able to use some of the other dimensions of that, uh, um, uh, that mass to, will that need wind estimation to make it doable with this plan? No, because the pit lips take care of that. Mm, right. Sounds like magic. That's <laughs> right. So the pit. <laughs> Just think. This is this is like a fly past. Yeah. Great. Having some in previous life, uh, in that it actually was straight lines between waypoints and then a brief time turn radius. Um, when we put that to use it, there's still a lot of users that say, "But I wanted to fly through the waypoint." Yeah. Okay, so so we're, we're going to need an attribute on a waypoint that's applied through or yeah. pass. Yeah. For recording purposes, make sure you repeat the question. Mm -hmm. the okay, so so what Paul said was that some users are still going to, I want to make it run through the waypoint, it turns before the waypoint. They want to, they want to fight, they want that's to right. So they want it to go past the waypoint, turn around and tangentially move back onto the waypoint. Now again, exactly the way plane does, we can do that. All it does means is that we can say, okay, we want to go to that waypoint, and now we're going to improve the complexity of our, like extend the complexity of our navigation, and add a few commands to MapLink, so we can define how we handle corners and that sort of stuff on a per waypoint basis, and it will take a bunch of different people to make changes through a whole heap of different things, but we'll be able to say, we want to go through that waypoint, and then go there, and it will take a curve back here, then do another curve to tangentially join back onto the navigation, the same as plane would do in that situation. But instead of plane, where it sort of just runs the L1 controller and with the tuning it will get back on there, we're able to precisely define exactly what that acceleration and what that speed is for that curve, because we're copter and we have, a, we have those extra degrees of freedom. We don't have to keep on moving. Now the other thing is if we want to actually be a pass within a particular distance of that waypoint, we can calculate what this turn radius needs to be. <laughs> based on that turn radius, we can calculate, given our maximum acceleration based on our parameters, um, do what do you want, Paul? Will need to, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to um, use vehicle um, capabilities, because with planes, tailwind, yep means um, big turn radius. Yep. So, so this is, no, no, but this is for copter. There's no wind with copters. Well, no, there, there is, so, no, no, copters still, go, still, still have a limitation. That's right, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll deal, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, now you've brought it up, I'll deal with that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your fault. <laughs> so, um, so now we have, we have this, uh, so we know what this acceleration is um, and, and what a maximum acceleration that we're allowing is. So we now know what the maximum velocity we can have here. And so we can now calculate back here at what point we need to start slowing down to reach the velocity we need there to be able to accelerate through there. And we, in our pit loops, in our navigation loops, we can say we're approaching a waypoint, we know it's this sort of waypoint, we know the maximum speed at this point is that. We can um, check to see if we're actually got to that point and what that velocity request is going to be, and we can slow that point down. So now we can do things, whereas before, the aircraft would just sit there and all of a sudden it would start leaning left as the, as the end of that rubber band headed that way and it would sort of come in and you know, go around the corner, but it was somewhat variable. Now we can come in, we can go, okay, we want to deaccelerate at this rate, um, and then once we get to this turn, we can actually do a coordinated turn around that, 
predefined curve and stay right on that track and, and precisely define how we want to move between this state and the next. Ideally using S-curves, and there's a little slide at the end. So if anybody knows what S-curves are, they are um, for those who don't, they are jerk limited acceleration curves. If anybody knows much about those and there's those solution, those equations in two or three dimensions, that would be really helpful. So um, to answer Paul's question, the way the way Copter deals with wind is generally the navigation is more. Uh, so, so there are two states. Generally, I navigate the copter has more power available to it than than uh, than it needs to navigate. And so, when we have wind, for the most part, we're able to directly overcome that wind with that extra power. So we're able to deal with that extra force needed to fight the wind and still follow that precise path. And we've got enough left over to do our deceleration and and go around that curve. The problem happens when the wind grows to a point where we no longer have enough leftover power. At that point, where our acceleration limits are constrained further and in a particular direction. Um, and that's where, in these situations, we have two choices. We can go around it and ignore it, and in which case we'll probably have an error coming around here, and then let the pid loops just pull it back onto, onto the path, and that's what we'll do initially. Um, as if we have more time, we clean it up and, every, and the structure, and we get everything, all our I's dotted and our T's crossed, and Randy's fixed my spelling mistakes, um, we can actually start accounting for that and say, okay, to fly in this straight line, we're, we're using up this much of our power holding over at a 45 degree angle so we can follow this track. I have bugger all left to turn around this corner. So my acceleration constraint has shrunk. So now, in order to go around this corner, I need to slow down a lot more to actually go around that corner, stay right on that path within my acceleration constraints. But all that is very doable now because you know, everything's well defined. We no longer have this leash that, although it allows us to do it easier, it, um, it, it also pre present, um, hides a lot of that information from us that we can use to deal with issues like that. So, yeah, um, so that's, <coughs> uh, any questions, I'm not going to, I'll finish the talk there, I'll flip through to the last slide, I was going, if I, if I blew through all that, whoops, I was going to um, talk, uh, show you uh, the, added, the new attitude controller loops, so that's my question for anybody in the crowd and anybody watching. Um, if anybody uh, knows or has the equations for two or three axis S loops, which is jerk limited curve generation, which means you go around a corner accounting for the jerk. I've got all the equations for um, uh, one dimension, which um, basically means you've got to solve seven equations going through a jerk limited acceleration, an acceleration limited, up to velocity limited, up and then back down again to stop at a known point. Um, I would like those in two dimensions if anybody's got them, um, and uh, three dimensions too if you've got those. But uh, I would settle for two dimensions and uh, I'll deal with height as a separate one. But does anybody have any questions, comments, or general heckling, Paul? <laughs> I've always wondered, is there another technique besides PIDs that people use to control things like this? Yes, they are, uh, but uh, I know very little about them. Um, Paul knows a lot more about them. There are plenty of, there are some advanced control techniques, but the problem with a project like this is that they start requiring model-based design approaches. So, the, the, the issue, the reason we haven't really progressed much on PID loops for the, the, the list of the project is they, they work adequately for most applications. 
applications and users can choose them. As soon as we end up with something requiring offline parameter identification, putting in mathematical models and, and doing the tuning from that, which is what we used to do when I was um, working for, you know. When you used to work. When I used to work, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, but it was that, that, it was model based design. Um, and you get pretty good results with that, but it's just not appropriate. The, the other thing with the model, any model-based design, the um, the result of that, those controls are only as good as your model and your ability to actually make a measurement to generate that model. And so, unless you, you know, so the, the complexity of doing that process is such that you've got to do all of that very well to get the same sort of results as a well-designed PID loop with you know, a system like where we've removed the non-linearities, handled the limits and that sort of thing. Um, so we sort of deal with a lot of those obvious problems straight up and the PID loop deals with the remainder. Um, a model-based design would take through and deal with all of those all at once in one, well, depending on the model, one cohesive unit. And if that's done ex extremely well, you can get great results. But you need a lot of money, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of tools to do that, um, and that's beyond, you know, all the you know very serious, uh, you know, high dollar projects. The reason I ask about wind estimation is there's some types of vehicles where you really want to fly a constant airspeed instead of constant ground speed, and uh, so the, the classic example is a helicopter just sitting behind you where you're trying to fly at its airspeed limit. And in that case, you really, you don't want it to fly slower, you know, upwind than downwind. You, you want it to fly constant airspeed the whole time. Um, and so I think we're either going to need to start putting airspeed sensors on those sort of vehicles, yep. or start getting wind estimation. Um, oh. And uh, and then the, how are we going to integrate? If we Imagine we had fantastic wind estimation for helicopters or some types of multicopters, I think, as well. Yeah. How would we integrate that into these navigation controls? So, so the plan for that, um, and I was talking about this just before, um, is we want to add a generic output. Now, this is going to take a lot of thought and a lot of, you know, tweaking um, to sort of work out before we can even start implementing this. But what we want to do is we want to build uh, the output of the navigation will effectively be a three-axis um, uh, uh, acceleration request. And it may actually have velocity information in there as well if it's there. But fundamentally, a three-axis acceleration. Um, and so, uh, let's say that you are, you've got a, um, a multi-rotor with um, a lifting surface, which has a lot of parallels to a helicopter, um, and some of those VTOL-type aircraft, um, if you've got a lifting surface, you've got an additional acceleration or additional force vector on that aircraft that's associated with wind speed, now, uh, or, or air speed, true air speed. So if you um, know what states, know that information, and you know the what acceleration you need to follow this path, you are then able to build a, a model in there that says, okay, uh, I have a wing that's got a tilting uh, thrust vector. Um, so at this velocity, I'm expecting a thrust vector of this much from the wing and this much from uh, my, uh, my propellers. So I want a total thrust vector of this in this direction. So to achieve that thrust vector, um, the solution to that problem is I tilt the wing this much and I increase um, the thrust from my pellet propellers, and that gives me my desired um, total thrust vector in the direction I want, and the aircraft then follows that that course. And so, by taking that three, so by adding that stage between the output of the attitude controller, I'm uh, sorry, the output of the position controller, and the attitude controller of that particular aircraft, you, you're able to. Uh, account for those additional factors of different types of aircraft. Right, so uh, thank you very much Leonard for your presentation.